Publica. I'm here to welcome you to our event while we connect everyone who signed up. We'll get started in a moment as soon as we reach a critical mass. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from members of the reporting team behind ProPublica's Pulitzer Prize winning Disaster in the Pacific series, um, which investigated the Navy and the Marine Corps following a string of fatal accidents. We'll also hear from one of the dozens of officials who the team interviewed for the series, and the team will share how and why they brought this powerful story to light. And I'll introduce everyone to you in just a moment. We'll also be answering your questions today. Um, so if you've already submitted a question, thank you so much. If you're in the webinar with us, um, if you'd like to submit a question during the discussion, you can just click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to type it in, and we'll try to answer as many as we can live. And again, if you just joined us, good afternoon. Welcome to today's conversation. And it looks like we have enough folks on to get started, so let's get into it. Um, again, my name is Cynthia Giwa. I'm ProPublica's Marketing Director, and I hope you've had a chance to read some of the series our panelists will be discussing today. It's called Disaster in the Pacific, and a few weeks ago, it won the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting, so congratulations to the team. Um, I'll share a bit with you about the series so our panelists can jump right into the conversation. Disaster in the Pacific centered on three deadly accidents in the Navy and Marine Corps in 2017 and 2018. Um, this includes the collisions of the USS Fitzgerald and the USS John S. McCain, as well as a nighttime aviation training that went wrong. 23 service members were killed in these accidents. In ProPublica's investigation, reporters revealed how senior Navy and Marine Corps leaders ignored years of warnings about broken ships and planes, outdated or faulty equipment, and undertrained sailors and aviators who were overextended and exhausted. And when the accidents occurred, investigations led by senior officials blamed rank and file service members for what were clearly systemic shortcomings. Bringing this series to light involved overcoming big obstacles, and today we'll hear from um, we'll hear about those from journalists who worked on it. We'll also hear from one of the dozens of military officials who shared their experience with ProPublica. And I'd like to introduce him first, um, Bryce Benson, a retired Navy commander and captain of the Fitzgerald. Thank you for joining us, Bryce. We're honored to have you here. Thank you for having me. And we also have, and I'll list them all one by one. We also have reporters Key Christian Miller, Megan Rose. Robert Fadarechi, and Kengo Sutsumi, ProPublica's social media and platforms editor. And we have an editor on the series and our moderator today, Tracy Weber. Again, if you'd like to submit a question at any time during the webinar, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to type it in. We'll get to those during the Q&A portion. But first, I'll throw it over to ProPublica senior editor, Tracy Weber. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, as one of the editors on this project, I had a front row seat to the sort of meticulous, exhausting, relentless reporting that went into this project. Um, reporting on the military in general is incredibly difficult. There's sort of a code of silence and they, talking to outsiders is very difficult. And um, these stories, which expose the systemic failings of the Navy required patience, persistence, and people who are willing to take, take a risk. And I'm, I'd like to have them talk about it. And I wanna throw it over to T. Let's start at the beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about how you found this story? Sure, so this story began with um, the actual collisions that happened in 2017 in the summer. Um, at that time, I, I read about them. Uh, as many other people did, they were at the time the Navy's uh, most serious disasters, accidents at sea in 40 years. Um, there was a lot of coverage at the time, but as I was reading through the coverage, I felt like a lot of it was about what and not about why. Um, and so uh, a year later, when the, um, the beginning of the trial came along, and the court martials began uh, for both the uh, Fitzgerald and the McCain, the USS McCain, which was the other destroyer involved in these two uh, incidents. Um, I knew that that was a small window of opportunity um, because uh, military trials are open to the public like most civilian trials are, but as soon as they are over, they close down and you can no longer get access to those records uh, except through a very long and difficult process of using the Freedom of Information Act. 
So I made sure that as soon as the trials came up, I went and I sat, I sat and listened to all the trials and just watching, they were, the, they were of two sort of um, junior officers aboard uh, the Fitzgerald at the time. Uh, and I remember just sort of watching them and realizing that there was more to the story to be told. There were just little hints given uh, at the trials about, um, you know, orders not, uh, uh, complaints having been made and the ship not being adequately trained. And, and so I decided to investigate it a little bit further um, and that kind of, I've been, I've been covering the military on and off since, um, the, since 1999, um, the invasion of uh, the attack on Kosovo. And so I knew that uh, I have sources. So I went kind of to my sources, which is always important just to go back to people who you've learned to trust and, and, and access them again. And in this case, uh, I made a bunch of rounds sort of talking to people I've known in the past. Uh, just making a plea for any kind of documentation or information they might have about these, um, these incidents. And lo and behold, one day uh, we received um, a, a anonymous 13,000 page report, which was the kind of Navy's own internal investigation into uh, the Fitzgerald crash specifically. Um, we called that the, the chicken because uh, we got a message that the chicken was in the pot. And so then we knew, okay, here's the chicken. Let's kind of begin investigating it. Um, and I remember going to Megan at that point in time uh, and saying, hey, Megan, do you want to uh, jump on board for a quick story on this uh, Fitzgerald report? And she, with enthusiasm, said yes. And that began actually an 18 month long reporting process. Because although it may, may seem like you've got a lot with 13,000 <laughs> pages, you've actually just begun because you need to kind of get behind the scenes, you need to talk to the sailors talk to the officers, get a wider understanding of how these uh, fit into the bigger picture. And that's what we were aiming at first, is to go after, right from the start, we wanted to find out more about the why, uh, why these accidents had happened, and uh, what, had, what, had, what had happened, if anything, to set them up. And so that's kind of how the story started. And I'll just jump a little bit ahead when I knew we were on to something, uh, is when uh, Robert um, went to go visit uh, an admiral at his house, um, uh, to try and inquire to him, like, well, what can you tell me about, about this story? And uh, the guy came out of his house and he'd been working in the backyard or something and he, uh, he, he wouldn't talk to us. But he told Robert, he said, what you're doing is very important. And that was kind of the key for us to know there was more to untangle here. We needed to untangle more and find out more. And that's what really kind of started the whole, the whole story off. Uh, I don't think any of us suspected it would be quite so involved or quite so long, but I think in the end it showed a really important message, um, not only to the Navy, but to our military in general about the importance of heeding the warnings um, that you're getting from up and down your chain of command. Uh, that's not something that uh, any military branch has ever done perfectly or well. Uh, and certainly one of our discoveries and our main findings in the story was that the higher, the most high echelons in the Navy uh, had kind of turned a blind eye to complaints that had been run up and down the ladder by um, Captain Benson and many other folks uh, in the in the chain of command who had said, you know, we've got we're not where our training is down, our equipment is down, we're running uh, as hard as we can, as fast as we can in the Seventh Fleet, which is which covers the the Western Pacific, um, and so we just knew that 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 story, the full story, needed to be told because it was an important story about the lives and deaths of the 17 sailors on these two ships. But it was also an important story about the, the national security um, ramifications of having not enough ships, not enough people, not enough equipment deployed overseas to adequately protect our country. Um, Megan, I wanted to talk to you a little bit. As a veteran military reporter, you were constantly shocked that a higher ranking officers were willing to talk to you about their criticisms and be open about the failings of um, the, the military in this case, and the Navy in this case. Could you talk a little bit more about what that meant to have these officers speak candidly about their um, critiques? Yeah, definitely. You know, I started reporting on the military around 2005, and um, I was in Japan where the Seventh Fleet was based and embedded with units in Iraq, Afghanistan, or time at Pentagon. Um, and what held true over those years on the beat was that higher up the chain of command you went, the less likely they were to express 
any criticism. Like officers at higher ranks either were just unwilling to talk at all or what they said was very carefully crafted. You know, and the military has this strong culture of loyalty and sacrifice that puts a lot of pressure on people not to speak. Um, and there can be real ramification to a service member's career for doing so at, at any rank. Um, and then when you start getting high enough, officers, um, some officers have their own public affairs officer. So the message just gets more and more controlled. And then once an officer has a star on his or her shoulder, like an admiral or a general, the chances of getting them to speak are to speak frankly are like near zero. It just very rarely happens. Um, and the Admiralty is a small club. You know, in the case of the Navy leadership we were writing about, many of them had gone to the Naval Academy together. So Admiral John Richardson, who was the top um, Navy officer at the time, he even talked about how he would never have passed physics had he not copied off of the Admiral who's currently in charge in the Pacific, right? So these are people who have grown up together through the ranks since they were like 18 years old. So you make admiral and not only does the culture tell you to hold your tongue, but it also comes down to criticizing, criticizing friends and colleagues you've had for decades in this very tight knit community. Um, and that culture goes on even when you retire. So, you know, the Navy has these regular conferences for admirals and after the two collisions, a presentation at one of them was about how to talk about the accidents. So these men and women are out of uniform, but the Navy is still expecting them to stick to the script. So when we started our investigation, I, I told Tracy, I said, it's just going to be a super challenge to get anybody to talk to this. I did not think it was going to happen. I thought we were going to rely a lot on those 13,000 pages of documents and not have um, people backing us up or backing up the documents and confirming what was in there. Um, but I was just blown away that we found this um, cadre of admirals who were willing to talk to us. They were, they were open to it, receptive to our um, requests. And, you know, we, of course, we had to do some convincing and some would only talk off the record because you know, violating the culture felt too risky for either their current position within the military or future um, employment afterwards. Um, but one by one, these admirals kept coming forward. And I would call Tracy and just in complete disbelief say, we got another admiral. Like, it was just incredible. And, you know, to be clear, ProPublica or the media in general was not their first choice. Like they weren't comfortable publicly sharing failures of the Navy with us. You know, many had families that served for generations and they would talk at length at how much they loved the Navy and what their service meant to them and just how it felt like a fraught thing to come forward. Um, but they felt like something had to change. Like many of them had been writing memos and voicing their concerns internally to no avail for years in some cases. Um, and ultimately these were just admirals that felt like too much was at stake to stay quiet. And I think that's what made us really realize the true magnitude of this story. You know, like what T said, when we started looking at it, we were approaching with the question of how do two Navy destroyers have such avoidable collisions in such a short period of time in the same area of the world? And we knew that there was more than just what's happening on those ships. But it really wasn't until all of these admirals, at great risk to their own careers and their reputations and to their friendships, when they agreed to sit down and talk with us and take us behind the curtain and kind of walk us through the specifics of the bad leadership decisions and the willful blindness to what was happening on these ships, not until then that I think we really truly grasped how much bigger this was than the Fitz and the McCain and even the Seventh Fleet. Like this was a story about the Navy itself and its systemic problems that stemmed from the very top. Um, and we couldn't have written, you know, the angle of accountability in that regard without our sources being willing to take that great risk. And their willingness really drove home how important this public reckoning was about the Navy because it was just so systemic. So that's kind of a perfect pivot to you, Robert, because we've, you know, wrote the Navy stories about how the top of the chain of command refused to sort of take responsibility, leaving the lower ranking officers to shoulder the blame. We then moved on to, you, you did a story about the Marine Corps and a, a failure there. How did the, well, how did your findings compare between the Navy and the Corps? So, you know, as we were going up the chain of command in the Navy, um, a pattern started to emerge that the people who had spoken out uh, and raised warnings before the uh, tragedies, you know, they were either, you know, ignored or worse, they were chastised or even pushed out. 
Um, you know, we heard about the example of Admiral Thomas Copeman, um, who is essentially in charge of uh, ensuring the fitness of the Navy surface ships. And a few years before the tragedies, um, he had given a speech at a Navy symposium where essentially what he said was that uh, the Navy was spending too much resources, uh, you know, buying new ships and not enough taking care of the ones that had and training its sailors. Um, and what we heard was that, you know, within hours after, uh, you know, giving that speech, he got calls from representatives for the Navy's uh, secretary and top military officer um, asking him essentially, how could you betray your bosses? Um, and even more significantly, and this was something that, that Copeman uh, confirmed to me on the record, um, was that soon after he gave that speech, um, he was told by the Navy's top officer to submit his retirement papers early. Um, it was a similar story with Janine Davidson. She came in um, as undersecretary of the Navy. Uh, and almost immediately what she described was seeing that uh, the Navy surface fleet was in decay. In decay. Uh, there was a dangerous decline um, in the skills of the sailors on these ships. And in meetings in the Pentagon with her boss, uh, you know, then Navy Secretary Ray Mabus, she tried to urge him to uh, devote, devote more resources to taking care of what they had instead of this sort of obsession with buying more ships. Um, and what she said is that she was sort of iced out um, and also told that she couldn't take her concerns to Congress. So it was another example of someone speaking up before tragedies and uh, basically being shut down. So when we started examining, you know, so that was basically a pattern that established in the Navy's surface fleet. Um, and we, you know, then we started examining uh, the Marine Corps and their aviation operations and specifically a squadron out of Japan, Squadron 242, that suffered a mid-air collision that killed six Marines. Um, and the story that the Marine Corps put out was that this was basically a group of cowboys. They, they weren't uh, following safety protocols. There was a case of adultery, you know, off-duty drinking, that kind of thing. Um, but what we learned after digging deeper, um, you know, through sources, we got a, a trove of documents. Uh, and I remember emailing, uh, you know, Tracy, T, Megan, Joe, everyone, as I was reading these on the way home. Um, and, and what they showed was that what really happened was that the uh, commanding officer of that squadron for months before the crash had been regularly warning his bosses that his men were dangerously undertrained, that they weren't able to do basic mission sets, uh, that their planes were broken. Um, and after the crash, again, the, the, the person, you know, the highest level person who was disciplined um, was that commanding officer who had been raising the warnings. Um, you know, the, the Marine Corps had also left out that it knew about uh, faulty equipment that these Marines were given. And that was never, you know, shared with the public or the families. So, you know, a pattern that we saw in the Navy's surface fleet that the people who spoke out were the ones who got smacked, again, repeated itself with the Marine Corps. Um, one of the key points or uh, people on the team was uh, Kango, who helped us um, track down sailors who would be willing to talk on the ships and various sources for us all over the world and devised ways to to reach these people through all kinds of different media and also how to get the story out, the word out to the communities who needed to read the stories. And it was really an integral part of our process. And I wanted Kango to tell you a little bit about what he did and the impact of that. Yeah, so my support uh, on this project sort of began after we'd published the first two investigations, um, the one looking at the fits and the ones focusing on the chain of command. Originally, um, we noticed that we had all of these sailors that were reaching out to us wanting to talk. So we decided to sort of formalize the process using one of our online forums or like call out things. And originally our goal was to speak to sailors in every active fleet because we'd gotten this list of all of the reforms that the Navy promised after the accidents. And we wanted to sort of check up on people, you know, in the different areas to see how those things were and weren't happening. Um, 
So in sort of distributing this call out and trying to get the word out, I ended up talking to all sorts of different people. Um, I got really into the Navy subreddit. It's this really active community of people or sailors who are sharing super candidly because it's on the internet and sharing things that they felt like they couldn't talk about, uh, but sort of connecting over their common experiences. So I was sort of able to like backfill the lines that the original investigations had drawn and see sort of the commonality across the different fleets. Um, I also made, got in touch with a lot of military journalists, journalists who happened to be veterans and like editors of the different trade publications. I reached out to the Navy Times over a Facebook message, uh, asking them to share some of our stuff so that we could just be sure that they were hitting, it was hitting the right community. Um, so yeah, in doing all of this, I was able to build this super awesome network of like veterans, service people, trade journalists, uh, yeah, just sort of like the world over. And at the bare minimum, we had a great concerned audience to sort of send stories to any time that we published them. Uh, finding and talking to McCain sailors sort of before and after uh, Captain Benson's profile came out and, you know, seeing their reaction because they were sort of suffering or alone or that kind of thing was really, really, really incredible. Um, yeah, so it was really cool to sort of have these things that I knew how to do, like how people use the internet or sort of crawling around and digging through stuff to support a project like this. Like it sort of blew my mind that I was able to contribute in any way. Um, this kind of leads me to Bryce because what, what he mentioned was how uh, sailors who had suffered, you know, sort of post-traumatic stress or other issues following the crash and their experiences were really moved by Megan's profile of your experiences. And before the collision, you devoted two decades or nearly two decades of your life to the Navy. And then after the crash, the Navy tried to court-martial you for murder. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about what made you to decide to actually speak about the mental health toll that took and, and you know, share your experience with us. It, certainly, Tracy. Um, but first of all, thank you for inviting me to be a member of this panel. Uh, this is a first for me to share a screen with Pulitzer winning journalists. Um, congratulations to, to you and your team. Um, really, uh, your, your professionalism and approach to this story uh, has truly made a positive impact, so, so thank you. Uh, I think it's important to, to start when I first met Megan uh, in the summer of 2018, um, where Daryl Martin, the father of, of one of my shipmates, uh, Xavier, that we lost on June 17th, uh, he invited me to speak at a dedication ceremony for his son. Uh, by this point, three of the five original charges had been referred to the general court martial. Uh, so as, as quickly as she introduced herself, I gave her my legal counsel's contact info. Uh, Megan, as, as nice and you are, as you are, I just did not want to talk to you. Um, you see, uh, you know, tr trust was a central theme in how I interacted with those around me at that point. On the night of the collision, I trusted very talented and competent people to, to keep us all safe. Um, and as you mentioned, senior leaders, senior Navy leaders came after me in a very real way. And as multiple inaccuracies and inconsistencies with the government's case against me added up, I lost trust in them too. Uh, I, I, I truly felt isolated, you know, with the exception of my amazing wife and kids, my parents, my faith community, uh, my brilliant legal counsel, some tremendous doctors and clinicians up at Walter Reed, you know, and, and some very close friends. Um, this was my inner circle. Uh, no, no one else got in. So this was a massive bridge for your team, not only to build, but to cross. But uh, your team saw the light of truth in the story and pursued it. Um, I think like anything else, it was a process for them. Um, while within the I'll say kind of the, the protective bounds of the court system. Um, I only spoke to ProPublica with counsel present. Um, but you know, as we worked together, uh, I, I found that your team it was genuine, hardworking, thorough, and strictly adhered to your journalistic code. And mind you, while I was in uniform, this is one of the, the principles that I, I swore to defend. 
Uh, I saw many other outlets, uh, they were publishing inaccurate accounts that I really felt aligned with the skewed narrative that senior Navy leaders were trying to advance. So the decision of who to trust was more clear, but, but I'll tell you the consequences always frightened me. So kind of moving forward just a bit, uh, last summer after the former CNO dismissed the charges, and I think it was while I was preparing uh, my 18 page rebuttal to the Secretary of Navy, Navy's letter of censure on me, uh, I joined a creative writing group um, on the Wal Walter Reed campus. And it's hosted by a nonprofit called Community Building Artworks. It was there where I could better explore my, my trauma, excuse me, my trauma in a safe environment um, the CEO of CBAW, Sima Riza, uh, also published a brave and honest and intensely personal struggle in her life. The name of her book is When the World Breaks Open. And reading through her nar narrative, she conveys that silence is dangerous. This resonated with me and has been one of the tools in how I manage, manage the challenges with mental and behavioral health. So while senior uh, Navy leaders were fumbling with how to handle my disposition, uh, your team was willing to shine a light on how this matter personally affected me. Uh, I was expecting some level of retribution from other senior Navy leaders uh, for my participation on this ex exclusive. Um, you know, but really, in instead, I found an amazing, encouraging and supportive community of those coping with loss and grief and trauma. I mean, the list can just go on. I learned that there's no spectrum to trauma and then you do not need to be nearly crushed by a, a 30,000 ton tanker in the middle of the night to be affected by mental illness. Uh, I, I was willing to risk a lot um, to help your readers understand and get closer to the truth and, and hopefully encourage others either suffering from mental health conditions or those who observe a, a mismatch uh, from the standards promised uh, and the standards actualized to, to reach out. Thank you so much for that, Bryce. Um, so we're gonna actually move on to questions from the audience now. Um, as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to type it to us. Um, but our first question actually was emailed in advance. It comes from Bob. Uh, Bob asks, what effect did the federal government's sequester of funds have on the readiness training and operational tempo of the Fitzgerald and McCain? Did you look at whether these funding shortfalls may have helped place these ships and crews in dire straits? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so for those of the, you in the audience don't remember, in 2012, there was what was called the budget sequestration, um, which was basically massive kind of slashes mandated by Congress um, to all budgets, but uh, the military as well. Um, and so we certainly talked to a bunch of people who kind of point to that time as being um, when things started to get bad in terms of funding uh, more manpower and repairs to ships and things like that. Um, certainly there were cuts to the Navy, uh, Air Force, Marines, um, uh, and sort of it, it involved a lot of kind of shell gaming from that point forward in terms of having to kind of get other steal and rob from other budget funds. Like you might remember back during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, there were sort of special funds set up and so they were kind of taken from, but none of that was really used for long-term planning. And what we heard over and over again was that the sequestration and sort of the other budget issues just really impacted the, the Navy's ability, the military's ability to plan. And the military in general needs needs sort of a, a horizon of, of, of years, if not, if not decades, to plan to kind of meet upcoming structural threats to national security. And so, yes, the answer is the sequestration, um, which just ended only recently, did have uh, a long-term impact on our military's ability to um, train and prepare its, sol its soldiers, uh, airmen, marines, sailors uh, for warfare. And, and specifically, I mean, part of the way the Navy cut its budget, um, they had planned upgrades for, you know, software and computer on DDG class destroyers, including the Fitz and the McCain. And that was one of the things that was scrapped that very specifically affected these ships. Um, you know, one of the sort of most memorable details 
in that first story was that, uh, you know, part of the FITS systems was running on Windows 2000 at the time. Um, so, you know, it, it, in a general way it affected, but also in, in a very acute way. Okay, our next question um, comes from the webinar. Have you, heard any, have you heard anything from members of Congress regarding consequences or even congressional reviews? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the House Armed Services Committee um, just had a hearing, I don't know, maybe three months ago at this point, uh, mainly focused on uh, Squadron 242 um, and the actions the Marine Corps was taking after that crash, but also, uh, you know, the reforms the Navy was supposed to institute um, after the Fitzgerald and McCain. Um, and, you know, multiple members came by to me afterwards and said they were, you know, pushing the Marine Corps to uh, be more forthright than it had been before, that they were, uh, you know, grilling them in private about some of these uh, equipment malfunctions. Um, and I know I've, I've still been in touch with a couple of them. I, I know that they're still, um, you know, on the issue. It hasn't sort of fallen on the back burner. They are very eager to see reforms um, and they're very eager to, to have the whole story shared with them, right? Something that our series did was show that, uh, you know, Congress wasn't fully informed about the readiness shortfalls in the Navy or Marine Corps. And, and that has motivated Congress to, you know, want to start seeing the whole story. Uh, next question is from Justin. Um, basically, do you, do you see any real progress being made in the fleet or is it basically just the same types of problems continuing? Uh, so we did. So so Kango uh, helped a lot in that particular uh, aspect. He referenced that we got a list from uh, the Navy, the then CNO uh, or the uh, Vice uh, Chief of Naval Operations, had um, basically drawn up a list of 112 individual reforms. Some of them were kind of difficult to pin down with specificity, but uh, we sort of went down the list of 112 and reached out to. Um, sailors in different fleets um, reached out to our sources and kind of ticked them off. And yes, the Navy has done some things. Um, for instance, uh, they shifted a lot of the, some, some manning to the seventh fleet, which is in the Western Pacific um, and based in Yakuza, Japan. And so they tried to shift uh, more folks over to um, the Western Pacific, uh, but that was kind of moving a little bit of moving um, deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, but uh, because it ended up sort of like uh, moving people from San Diego, which is another big naval base, um, and leaving some of those ships uh, shorthanded. So um, I don't want to at all sort of say that the Navy has stood by and ignored this problem, but the folks that we talked to um, make specific things that could be done better. Well, one of them is updating equipment so that you're not relying on um, ancient and failure prone uh, radar, for instance. Um, another is that you increase your, your manpower and you fill gaps. The, the Fitzgerald, for instance, as Bryce can speak to, um, was missing a senior quartermaster who is the individual in charge of sort of navigation type issues um, for a long time. And they've been asking and asking and asking for a new senior quartermaster. Um, so uh, yes, the Navy has done some things, but I think it's, it's, my, it's fair to say that what people told us is that there's much more to do. Mm -hmm. Um, we've gotten a few questions like this next one from Nicole. How do you establish trust with sources? What are the types of questions you ask when you don't know what you're looking for, but one sources who may not trust you or are shy? How do you, you know, what kind of questions do you ask to get these kinds of sources to open up? Uh, that's a um, really good question. Well, obviously, we were dealing with admirals and others um, from all across the ranks who were a little wary of, of speaking out and didn't know us um, personally. And so I think, I think for the higher ranks, um, a lot of it was sitting down and saying, listen, Admiral, I don't I don't know everything that you know, and just being really bluntly honest with them and be like, I need you to kind of take me by the hand. And we um, often would have a piece of paper and a pen and we would hand it to them and be like, can you draw? Like, can you, maybe you could just explain, take us in the beginning and talk to us about like what your chain of command is like, go to the basics. And so we would start with questions that um, 
weren't super scary, but things that we needed to know anyway. And it kind of led um, to their, you know, Bollywick of being able to explain things and, and knowing the answers and knowing the Navy really well. And so we always kind of started from a point of put us in your shoes and what you do in your job and help um, take us through. And then there was a lot of assurances that, you know, like you can talk to us off the record. We, we don't have to go on the record right now. Like, let's, let's talk about um, things that are important to you, but without any sort of consequences of it being in the paper or seeing your name, just, just help us understand, like, let, so we know we're on the right track and we're asking the right questions. And as we would talk to people in this manner, they would get more comfortable with us and they would, um, realize we were going to spend a lot of time digging in and it wasn't going to be a quick story and we weren't just looking for a quote. And so I think assuring them that we could, you know, do a proper investigation, help bring them along with us. Um, and it was just a lot of time. I think T and Robert would agree it was just sitting down with sources and spending an enormous amount of time and, um, you know, talking about whatever and letting them lead the conversation a little bit. For me as a reporter, when I don't know what I don't know, I often ask a very broad question and then I don't interrupt for a very long time. Even if I don't understand exactly what they're talking about, Oh. oh, Megan's a little frozen. Oh yeah, was it wasn't just me. No. <laughs> so, I, just, I mean, another <laughs> sort of challenge. Oh, go ahead. Yep. You broke up, Megan. Just you were frozen. Oh. Yeah. Um, I don't know where I broke up, but I was just saying, just let, letting them talk and letting them lead where they want to go. You just learn so much information. So I think sometimes it's not about what questions you ask, but it's just about being quiet and listening and um, letting them letting them lead you down the path and then obviously having a very long list of follow-up questions for understanding when you're talking about complicated things like you know training and manpower and you know understanding weapon systems and things like that which are not um in, we don't have inherent expertise on can i um captain benson could you answer that question a bit too like what was it um that you that that convinced you to entrust your story with us so some components that I really appreciated was your, um, you, you really want to know the details and, and not just the technical or, you know, rank structure. Um, but uh, gee, I think the, the first question you asked me, um, you asked me what I was wearing on June 16th. And uh, you said, don't, don't let any detail go unnoticed. And, uh, you know, I, I very clearly remember, you know, it was a Friday and every Friday I wore a belt buckle that my chief's mess gave me, you know, because I, I said, there's two things I love in this world. It's a Friday and my chief's mess. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I hung that on the back of my door and, you know, no, you know, when I, when I went to bed around midnight and, you know, an hour and a half later, it was, it was under a pile of metal. So, um, those, those things mattered. Um, uh, Megan, when you were, when we were walking through, you know, uh, uh, portions of how I've, I've been trying to move forward. And I went to that um, uh, seminar at the Army Navy Country Club. And you asked, what was I wearing? And, and you asked about my lapel pin. Were you wearing a lapel pin? And I said, yeah, wear my American flag lapel pin. Uh, those, those are important parts of me, which you cared about. Um, and also just the level of detail um, the times that you came back for clarification, um, because you wanted to get the story right. It wasn't a quick turn to, to get clicks or however journalists measure success with the story. Uh, yeah, I could tell that you were, and even when I asked you codes and you, or asked you questions about either sources or something, you said, I can't tell you that's, I'm, that, that's, that's against the journalistic code. So I knew that you had standards. Uh, you were adhering to them. So um, those those aspects were um, um, helpful with me, um, you know, kind of opening up you guys. And part of our job as, as journalists, right, when we're talking to potential sources is to sort of uh, try to understand what's motivating them to potentially talk to us or share documents with us. Um, and sometimes those motivations can be uh, you know, more self-serving, like, like want, you know, being upset that a colleague got a promotion and they didn't, 
or trying to hurt a political opponent. And overwhelmingly with this project, and I think T and Megan would agree, uh, the thing that motivated our sources and, and the argument that worked with them was by sharing these documents with us or by, by going on the record or by going on background and sharing these details, you will help make it less likely that this kind of disaster will happen again. Um, and so there was an enormous amount of selflessness in the, in the people who uh, talked to us and shared documents with us. They, they thought that even if they could make it 1% less likely that you'd see you know, young men and women killed again in, in a similar fashion, that it was worth it for them to risk their careers, their reputations, that kind of thing. Um, so, that, you know, in this case, that was an argument that worked again and again. So this next question is about the training um, for sailors. This is from a retired U.S. Navy captain. Um, as we've already indicated, inadequate, inadequate training was a root cause and prompted by the budget sequester to the military. Please indicate what training these diminished funds was used for. Um, so maybe Bryce can speak to what kind of training people got with these diminished budget. Yeah, so um, just to kind of baseline, I've, I've essentially been out of the surface Navy for over three years. Um, you know, but at the time, uh, I, I had confidence in our training programs for our junior officers. There was a continuum of training where um, a newly commissioned officer would go uh, to, to Norfolk or San Diego and get a baseline course, which included the fundamentals of seamanship and navigation. Um, then they would come to a ship. Um, they, would, they would go through their training requirements. And then as they transferred off, they would go back to Newport and go through an advanced course. Um, again, seamanship and navigation was a, a, a component. So I, I trusted the improvements that uh, my community was making um, you know, over the course of my career. Uh, I was fortunate to, to go to Newport when I was uh, recently commissioned. Uh, the Navy took that program away about uh, uh, six or seven years after that, but um, uh, they, they responded and brought it back, um, you know, in some fashion. Um, so when I went to bed that night, I, I, I didn't think that was a deficiency of avoiding a 30,000 ton tanker. Um, and every rules of the road question, um, that's the question everyone gets right. Who has right of way in a crossing situation? So, um, there, there was there was just more to it. Um, I, I, I hope that answers the question. Our next question is from Jonathan. Uh, so he says, I know Joaquin GV isn't on, uh, but I'd love to hear more about the interactivity and the fight the ship piece. So Jonathan's talking about a graphic that was created by um, a freelancer that we worked with, Jonathan GB that simulated the collision of the USS Fitzgerald and portrayed it from the perspective of the sailors on board. Um, so can anyone from the recording team sort of speak to what it took to create that? Yeah, I can talk some of that. Um, this is both uh, Tracy Weber was an editor as was uh, Joseph Sexton who was another editor and, and both Tracy and, and Joe recognized this was a piece that had, we wanted this piece to, to grab people and, and to communicate its importance to people. And so one of those was there was a great visual angle to this piece, which is what did the, what did the um, ship look like? How did it feel on, on, that, on that night? And so um, Joaquin uh, GV, uh, his name is uh, Joaquin Gonzalez Vera, um, had worked for those of you who are journalism nerds, had worked on a, a project in the New York Times called uh, Snowfall many years ago. And it was a very sort of live and interactive um, experience on, on the web at that time. And we wanted to do something like that. So um, Joaquin assembled his team of folks and they used the same sort of rigor and care in their visual reporting that we did in our text reporting. Um, so they hired a 3D modeler to actually model what a, the inside of a, of a DDG um, destroyer model looked like. They model what the 30,000 ton uh, oil tank would look like and how it would look like. One of the extraordinary things that happened is when the, the oil tanker hit the Fitzgerald that actually pushed the Fitzgerald around in a 360 degree circle. So just imagine the, the titanic forces at work in having a ship go 360 degrees spinning through the, uh, 
the uh, Sea of uh, Japan. And so uh, we wanted to kind of create this visual medium that allowed you to kind of feel part of the story, to immerse yourself in the part of the story. So it opens up uh, with a scene of several of the sailors down in the birthing um, trying to escape as water is flooding in. And it's kind of a dark and kind of an ominous scene. And then we're going to show you how the, the ships moved in the water and how, how heavy the traffic was in different areas. And um, we just wanted to kind of make the, the visual element of this piece flow very seamlessly with the written element of this piece. Um, and so th that's where Joaquin just did brilliantly. I think it was also um, really important for a story like this uh, about a destroyer, which most people have no familiarity with, to give them a sense of just what the ship looks like in general, like even beyond the um, kind of the immersion that T was talking about, just like knowing when you say a birthing room on a ship, what what is that? What does it feel like? And Joaquin did such a Joaquin did such a great job in letting you feel like the, the closeness and the claustrophobia that you would have and that you just really don't get unless you've ever like gone down one of the little ladders into the room and, um, and so that was important because you can't connect emotionally with something that you just even can't picture. And the military is just such a, a foreign topic and the and ships are just not something anybody really encounters um, uh, very often in their lives. So it was really important to be able to uh, take people, give them something to like to grasp to the, visually. Um, and then also we just, we had amazing sources. They were able to I think they spent hours and hours on the phone together going through like, is this thing here in this particular spot? So the work that went into that was an, an incredible um, feat, I think. Our next question is from Shivam. What kind of resistance did you face from the authorities? Were there any threats as you reported this? So I've got a couple of good examples. Um, you know, as part of the reporting, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I went out to Japan um, to work with a freelancer we had out there, Josh Hunt, um, to try to find, you know, sailors who had been on the Fitz and McCain, get them to talk, get them to share documents. Um, and, you know, out of nowhere one day, uh, we got an email um, basically falsely accusing Josh of trying to bribe these sailors with free meals and drinks. Um, and that he was, you know, violating some sort of journalism ethical guideline by doing that. And, you know, first of all, you know, it's just sort of a common courtesy. You, you, you know, pay for the meal when you meet up with a source. But secondly, there was no bribe involved, right? Um, they also sort of denied that any of these people wanted to talk to us. And by that point, several of them had. Um, and so there, there was that effort, but then sort of more significantly, um, you know, for the, for the Marine Corps story, you know, after we got this trove of documents, you know, it's called a safety investigation. It's supposed to be kept internal. Uh, and as a result, people who are interviewed are very candid in a way they're not in these public investigations. And we got a hold of that, and that's what revealed a lot of the sort of top-level uh, failures that led to that crash. Um, and what the Marine Corps uh, sort of insinuated was that, you know, by being in possession of that and potentially publishing that, we were violating the law. Um, so they were sort of making this claim that uh, there may be sort of criminal consequences by us just sort of doing our job and, and reporting out the facts of this story. Um, so by, by no means were, were the Navy or Marine Corps sort of uh, helpful, uh, or at least their public information officers, were they, were they sort of helpful uh, in this process? You know, we, we were sort of meeting resistance at every turn. Um, we have a couple of questions on this from Elaine and James. Um, any insights into the USS Theodore Roosevelt situation and the punishment of Captain Crozier? And how does your investigation inform the current issues relating to the Roosevelt? I mean, I, I don't, I don't, we, we didn't um, do any kind of in-depth investigation on um, the Theodore Roosevelt uh, or Captain Crozier. But I think uh, from you know, an external point of looking at, at what happened is two kind of points of interest. One is that Captain Crozier uh, was in the Seventh Fleet, based in the Seventh Fleet at the time of the 2017 um, accidents. And a lot of the conversation about those accidents was a failure to speak up for your men and whether or not up and down the chain of command, there had been enough attention paid to 
to ordinary sailors and what their concerns were. Um, so with Captain Crozier, I don't know this to be true, but he was certainly sort of exposed to that discussion. Um, and I don't know if that played any kind of role at all in his decision to um, uh, sort of deal with his deal with his sailors and the outbreak of COVID on the Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, but I do know that it seems, again, from an outside uh, perspective, just as someone who's kind of kept up with the news, that it, it did seem to be sort of a, a not great sign that the, the Navy had 100% picked up on um, the, or, or welcome pushback from you know captains and commanders uh, who are sort of mid-ranked uh, officers um, to uh, to pay attention to what their concerns were. A question from Rosemary: Are these sorts of issues only happening in the Navy and Marine Corps? Do you have any information that there may also be systemic failures in the other services? How is this related to the culture at the Pentagon? Anyone? I don't know if we've done enough enough work to, to know that exactly, but right, certainly right. anybody who's worked at the Pentagon knows <laughs> <laughs> that it's difficult to get a straight answer out of many, many, many people in that building. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we had a couple of questions like that, so I thought I'd ask. Um, welcome. welcome folks who want to send in information. <laughs> Um, what do you do when a crucial piece of information is mentioned off the record? You keep it off the record. Um, I mean, you know, something we tell sources to convince them to talk to us is, you know, it's not just because we're trying to do the right thing when we don't burn you. It's that if, if we burn you, we ruin our own reputations and that of our news organization. So it's, it's also a very self-interested thing. You know, we, you can't burn someone when they tell you something off the record. But that doesn't mean we don't try really hard to get them to put it on the record. I think we had lots of conversations of being like, okay, that detail is really important. And it's trying to um, get them to understand that maybe the, the bigger role that that piece of information might play in how important the investigation comes across, or if it confirms something we've heard from somebody else, but we can't go through with it until we have somebody on the record. So there, there's a lot of discussions of, yes, of course, you always can trust us with it being off the record. But if it is really crucial, um, we will kind of come back to it. And sometimes we can come back to it because at ProPublica, we do these long-term investigations. We can let it simmer for a while. We have um, a kind of a rare thing in this business that we can maybe have two or three months and then we circle back and they might feel differently or things might have happened or other people might be on the record. We can say, hey, this Admiral is now talking to us with his name. Do you feel comfortable? And then that can encourage them. Um, so there is lots of persuasion that goes into it, I think. Um, sort of piggybacking on that from Justin, did any of the sailors who were sources report any retaliation from their chain of commands? I, I, you know, I, I think that if, if, if we ever heard of that in a way that was sort of actionable, um, we would definitely report it. Um, that's not something that's been in any of our reporting. Okay. Um, so I think we have so many questions here and not enough time to get through them all. I'm sorry to the many dozens of questions that are still here, but we do have time for one more. And I'd like to have Tracy close us out. Um, to ask our panel a final question. So the one thing that in the time that we have um, done this series and the last few months of, of painful um, pain in the economy, um, the specialized publications that cover the military have downsized or gone out of business. Most major news media do not have a dedicated mil reporter for the military. Um, what do you guys think, like, what is the importance of having uh, dedicated reporters watchdogging the military? And do you think that there's not enough coverage of what's going on with the military? Uh, so, I mean, this is a big issue of mine. I, I have a couple concerns about, um, in our business in general, do we have enough veterans who are reporters, enough people who have military experience as reporters? Um, it used to be uh, World War II, um, pretty common to come out of 
the war and um, you know work as a reporter or a journalist. And I, I think it's incumbent upon journalism in general to uh, bring in people with military experience and with veterans to be able to help them tell these very complicated stories. Um, it is a, a definite um, weakness as the, the industry contracts that some beats are not gonna be covered like they used to. Um, you know, the Pentagon was once a absolutely premier beat in the premier um, newspapers of this country. And it's now been shrunk down to, uh, you know, half, a half dozen perhaps of the larger news organizations that maintain a permanent presence. Um, and, and that's often a presence in the Pentagon, which is not the same as being a military reporter who's getting out there in the field, talking to sailor soldiers, airmen, Marines, and trying to kind of dig under what the daily press briefing is by the Department of Defense. So um, I don't have easy answers other than to say that uh, I think covering the military, we are at a critical juncture in national security times with the rise of China, um, continuing issues with Russia. Um, it's not like those guys are going gently as good night. They're constantly testing um, in, in different waters and different parts of the globe, our ability to respond. And, and um, so uh, being able to monitor that and understand how that's going, not to mention the fact that it's a $750 billion taxpayer funded budget that goes to the military every year, uh, I think it's vital. And I, I don't think that the military right now um, gets the same amount of coverage that it used to and certainly that it deserves. Bryce, what do you say to that? You might have to unmute. Bryce, what do you think about um, the lack of coverage on the military? Uh, well, um, I'm not well versed uh, in this topic, but um, I, I do believe a strong journalistic core is, is one of the strengths of our democracy. Um, it, it has been a good balance. Um, at least in in the matters of your reporting, um, as am I, you know, I have, I have concerns about you know those bodies which are designed to provide a, a check and balance to our institutions. Um, I think it is necessary. Uh, ProPublica provided that in this case, so um, yeah, it, it it sounds like T is well versed in it. It's a tough nut to crack, but it's. It's very important. So uh, my hats off to you know the hard work that you guys you guys are doing. Thank you. So we actually have a few more minutes left. So I'm going to go back to our uh, questions from the queue. Uh, maybe one of our reporters can answer this question. Not all all of you. Um, what was the most surprising thing you learned in researching and reporting this story? Or is there one thing that especially stands out for you? I mean, <laughs> Robert already mentioned this detail, but I continue to shake my head at the fact that Windows 2000, which is not even supported by Windows anymore, uh, is in wide use on uh, American warships. Okay. I, I have to piggyback on that because as, as an editor, when they were detailing the, the how behind some of the equipment was on these ships and you think of them as these highest tech warships, that was completely surprising to me. And the Windows 2000 was the, the, the prime example. Okay. Well, on that note, uh, <laughs> that is actually about our time for today. Thank you to all of our speakers and from all of us at ProPublica, thank you for joining us. If you haven't already, um, you can get more invitations to events like this by signing up for our Big Story newsletter. Um, by doing that, you'll also receive our biggest stories as soon as they're published, and you can get that at propublica.org newsletter. Um, and thanks again, everyone.